pleased to have Dr. Jody Janai here with us, and she's going to be talking about healthy self-talk. Uh, Dr. Janai has an educational doctorate in organizational leadership and a master's in speech communication. She, I might take this out based on what you just said. Are you still teaching at the U of M? Oh. She, <laughs> she currently teaches at Communication Studies Department at the U of M, and a number of community ed staff last winter had the opportunity to listen to her at our community ed leadership days in St. Cloud. And we believe that not only will you enjoy and benefit from her message both professionally and personally, but you will also laugh. And life is just better when we laugh. So please welcome Dr. Shelley tonight. happens when someone stands in front of a room full of people, it's kind of happening right now, and it goes something like this, um, what do I think of you, and what do you think of me, and what do I think you think of me, and what do you think I think of you, and what do I think you think I think of you, and what do you think I think you think of me, and then you get up here and you lose your mind, right? <laughs> You're all nervous. It's like, I hope I didn't offend you, and I hope he didn't think I was trying to say that he needs to. And then you realize that at any given moment, you can really have a problem with someone. You can have a conflict with someone. You can have a miscommunication with someone. Um, this is kind of present in everyday life, and we all deal with this. So my name is Dr. Jody Janati, and my specialty is conflict and negotiation. I've been in higher education for 21 years. I teach at one of our state prisons every semester, so you're not the worst crowd I've ever seen in okay? <laughs> And um, I deal mostly with the Department of Corrections. I just signed a contract to train with every private prison in the entire United States. So my staff's a little more intense, and I try not to bring that to like educators, <laughs> but it can be a little crazy. So I do some profiling work, and I do a lot on negotiating craziness out. So I'll give you some tips today on how to, you know, dial it down a little bit. I'm at a point in my career where you don't really even need to diffuse people anymore. You just got to get them confused a little bit, and that's fine, and then they'll just bring it down a notch. Um, in education, I do this all the time. The first uh, three years I was at the University of Minnesota, all my students were student athletes on academic probation. Do you know how competitive student athletes are? And then if they get a grade they don't like or they disagree with you, they will be just as competitive with their mouth. I had a guy come up to me through his paper midterm exam on my desk and he yelled, I can't believe you gave me a D, seriously. You see how I don't really want to have that conversation with 26 other pairs of eyeballs staring back at me? What would a good educator say there? I didn't give you a D. You earned a D, and that is a good answer. Although I also study negotiation, and if he knows how to go, that go on. So let's see how we can reframe that. I could say, I did say this, I'm really glad that you're upset. Because up until now, I didn't even know that you cared about my class. I mean, you never come to class, you never turn in anything, and you never email me. He's like, yeah. <laughs> um, that's what I'm trying to say, actually. I'm like, good, why don't you meet me after uh, class and we'll go through my grade book. Did you have any other questions? Did he? No. <laughs> that is exactly where we want someone. So I want to start today with um, making you think like Socratic method is so fun. You know, Socrates said, I cannot teach you anything, but I can make you think. As an educator, talking to educators, this is the worst crowd for me. It's like, I know what you're thinking. I am the same way. It's like, what is she going to teach me? I'm a, I, I get it. We all do that in education a little bit. There's a little piece of that when a new person gets up to train or educate. So I'm going to take the approach of, I do not know anything. Um, I know nothing, but I can make you think. So I just want to get the wheels turning and like give you some ideas to consider. And I want to take you down a little rabbit hole right now. Uh, what does Forrest Gump say about life? Wow. Yeah, you never know what you're going to get, right? What do other people say about life? Just anyone. Your grandpa. Life's a journey. Life's hard. Life's not fair. Life's not fair. Life's short. What if you have nine children? 
Life's busy, fun, roller coaster, nightmare. See, you can choose a lot of words. My students say, life's a garden. Dig it. Right, we have a lot of things about life. So I really want to push you right now as I'm talking to think back when you were growing up. What did your family say life was? Because there's moments in life where you get told. What, like, listen up. What, you're, you're seven now, you're a man, right? I'm gonna tell you what life's all about. Life isn't fair. Life isn't fair. Wasn't fair for me, and so who heard that story? Okay, there's some of us who never heard that story. So life is a journey. I have a sister, and she wears a necklace that says, it's not the destination, it's the journey. And then I have a dad who says, listen, Joan, life's a bowl of cherries, full of the pits. Okay, those two stories or narratives are very different. And um, let me just show you how a story affects your behavior, because it goes a lot deeper than you first know as you scratch the surface. My sister lived with me for a while. My washing machine blew up, and I threw a fit about that. And she's like, Jody, oh my gosh, like you have a life and you know what you're doing and I am so lost. And you know what, big deal, it's like a bump in the road, deal with it. A bump in the road on the journey to life. Guess what my dad said? Yeah, but right when you pay off all your appliances, you gotta, you gotta vent that one of them. I mean, you, you budgeted for that, right, Jody, you budgeted. Now you gotta understand, like life's a whole cherry, is full of the pits and you gotta be ready for it. Let's just take a guess who has more pits in their life in general. <laughs> It's almost like what you think about, you bring about, we've heard that with the law of attraction, but it is so true, even on this neuro-linguistic programming level, it is so true. So I just want to give you some things to think about. Are you hiding from your own happiness? I use life as a way to introduce this because I gotta believe we all have life. I don't know if we all have the same values and things, but we all have a life, so we can start with that. So some people say life is a gamble. I have an aunt who's like that, she had like a, something she had to get removed in her brain through her nose and it was very traumatic at the time and they said go home and talk to your family and decide if you want to do this or not she did not go home and talk to her family she did this i mean i like life's crap shoot what do you do 50 50 you win some you lose some i've always been lucky odds are in my favor and she scheduled it that day she lives her whole life with like a gambling metaphor she doesn't even know she does it and it affects her behavior directly. But guess what, it also affect, affects your behavior directly. You cannot even have a conversation with someone without choosing a context. Think about that. What is a good work ethic? What is trust? What is education? Oh my God, let's do education here. I used to teach a class, um, it was a doctoral level class at RBC University for their EBD um, principal and superintendent, those were the learners in the class. And I would say, let's write a teaching philosophy. And of course, educators write perfect APA style, everything's great. I don't care about that. I just want to know, what is education? Like, what is your teaching philosophy? Who are you when you're standing in front of a room full of people? Here's some of the responses I got. Students are like lumps of clay. And it's my job to mold them into the future mathematicians, English major, okay. If I'm a lump of clay, do I like sit in your class and just listen or do I get to talk? Oh my God, that's so funny that you said that because I just had a review done and my, and my supervisor was like, yeah, it's kind of like the students just sit there and talk. That's so funny you said that. I'm like, I didn't say that, you just told me that. <laughs> students are like empty vessels and it's my job to fill them with the knowledge of, uh oh, have you ever had someone get up in front of you and talk to you like you're an empty vessel? You can kind of feel that, right? It, as an educator, I don't know if you do teaching emails, I'm guessing some of you do, some of you don't. Isn't it funny how like over the years, all the emails kind of sound the same? That's a teacher who knows who they are when they're standing in front of a room full of people. Wouldn't you rather like tell people who you are than having them tell you who they think you are? I, when I taught in this one classroom at the university, I'd walk in after an English teacher would leave and the students would say, I'm so sick of that drama llama English teacher, oh my god. That one sentence, drama llama English teacher, <laughs> told me the whole narrative about how she conducts herself in the classroom with the students. So uh, my narrative, when I get up in front of my students, in my head is what I just said to you. I do not know anything, I will make you think. 
and you'll probably have fun too. Guess what students say? I don't know why I had to take this stupid class. It was elective for my major. But she was kind of fun and she really made me think. You know, I told you, but I didn't tell you I could make you learn anything. I mean, I almost like guarantee that's what my emails are going to say. How about this one? It is my job to cultivate the learning process so my students can flourish and grow. What is that? What context is that? Cultivate, grow. Gardening. Yeah, gardening. So then I write on the paper, um, what do you do with the weeds? <laughs> oh my god, that's so funny. I teach English one, and we like talk about weeding them out. That's funny that you said that. I didn't. You just told me that. Do you cater to the exotic plants? I do. I like the good. Yes, I always try to get the good student. Oh, that's funny you would say that. No, I didn't say that. You just said that. So it's really interesting to decide, like, who are you when you're on in front of a group? Are you a coach? Are you a teacher? Are you a tour guide? Are you a helper? Are you a friend? I mean, are you a construction worker? My dad builds pies. Jody, I built a pie. My mom dad, that's great. Hey, Jody, I built you a raspberry pie. Would you like to try to build pies? So he's very clear about who he is. He's not a baker. He's a builder of pies. Look at that rock. So what happens is, I just want to push you a little bit, because this is for every aspect of your life. What did your grandma say is a good work ethic? You know, what did your family say? Let's stick to education, just for the scene here. Um, how many of you heard this story growing up? Meaning there was no story. No one in your family went to college. No one talked about college. And your message was kind of like, you never heard them maybe say this, but the message was kind of like, I did just fine. You don't need to take on student debt. You don't want to take on all those student loans. You can make a living without going to college. That's what our whole family did. Education is a waste of time. Okay, some of you are not. Raise your hand. Let's look at this. That's a whole expectation for a set of people in this world, right? How many of you heard this story? I don't really care what your grades are. You're going to college because you need that piece of paper to make money and establish yourself in this world. You need that piece of paper. Just jump through the hoops. I don't care. Who heard that story? Oh, I see some hands. How about this one? College are the best years of your life. <laughs> you will grow into a better human being and be able to serve and give. Who heard that one? Okay, there's a lot of different stories in this room. And you know what? As someone who watches people carefully when they're doing activities in the classroom, it's always funny, like if I teach a night class, it's like that, that one storyline pops up real quick when I'm like, you can leave as soon as you finish the activity in your dyads. You put two people together with different stories, you watch the conflict. One of them's like, just punch it out. Let's get this done. Like, my show's on. Let's go. Who cares? Just pull it out. And the other one's like, no, wait. This is really interesting. This could really add that. Oh, this is a good question. Who cares? Just put your freaking name on it. I don't know. And you can just see how they kind of fight, and there's this tension. There's a lot of people who think they hate each other in this world. I'm going to say they don't hate each other. Their stories just don't align. There's so many different stories out there, right? So the stories that are in your head are affecting your behavior. And this is true for racism, sexism, any ism, ageism. This is true for um, if you're self-defeating yourself or you're being amazing. Let's say you were a little kid, remember? Why are you crying? Dad, I want these boots. Why are you crying? Dad, I want these boots. Please, Dad, I want Dad, I want well, don't cry. OK, listen. You're going to need to suck it up, Buttercup, OK? Because uh, life isn't fair, so deal with it. You know, I have to deal with it, and you're going to have to know. And I'm sorry to tell you, but like I said, you're a man now. You're like seven, so let's deal with this. <laughs> and then the story is, life isn't fair. OK, fast forward 20 years, and they have a really rough patch in their life. And the story is, life isn't fair. Who do they get to blame if the story is, life isn't fair? Only if they're in therapy do they blame their parents. Okay, they get to blame life. You can't even find who to blame. So you end up saying the gambling metaphor. Well, it wasn't in the cards for me. Oh, she's lucky. Oh, well, you made some. You go 50-50. What do you do? I'll just lay down and die. And you see a lot of people who can't function because they can't blame anyone. What if you were seven years old and you're like, Dad, can I have these new boots for winter? And your dad's like, why are you crying? I want the boots, Dad. Okay, listen. You're not going to get them just because you're throwing a fit. If you want something in this world, you have to figure it out. Go get a calculator. 
Go get a pencil. Okay, let's not cry. Let's figure it out. You're smart. Okay, how much are the boots? If you want something in this world, you have to figure it out. You can't cry. People aren't just going to give it to you because you want it. Let's do the math. And that kid figures it out. And then the story is, if you want something in this world, you've got to figure it out. Don't cry about it. 20 years later, they go through something difficult. What do they do? Who do they blame if their life isn't going well? Themselves. And they figure it out pretty quick. They're able to pull themselves up by their bootstraps, and they're like, I got this, oh my gosh, I got this. And then everyone else looks at them, like, why are you so smart? And they're like, I have no idea, I just have a good story, I guess, I don't know. I mean, they're no more bright than any of the rest of us, but they at least have that motivation in their self-talk that pulls them forward. This is something to coach in your families, in your communities. I think it's funny when you get into like bigger in community involvement, because one person will stand up and they talk about growing and gardening, and then the next person stands up and they're coaching. The next person stands up and like, I'm a tour guide, I gave you the map, follow the key, I don't hold your hand. And then the whole community speaks different language. I mean, you could change a whole uh, school culture by just agreeing on what is our context? Are we here to shine the light up and show you the way? I mean, decide on a metaphor and then maybe share language across everyone. The parents will say it feels solid. The community will say, I feel like I know what they're doing. The emails you get will be solid. I mean, this is something worth thinking about. But on a personal level, it's really worth thinking about how these stories affect your life. The angriest person I ever worked with one-on-one -on -one was a woman in our one female facility here in Shakopee. And her story, oh, in her head, since she was a little girl and she was raised by a single father and a grandpa, was every time she was vulnerable or showed any kind of emotion, this was the sentence that was screamed at her. Listen, life is just a little Twinkie that you keep on eating. <laughs> I don't think she eats Twinkies. Okay? It's hilarious to someone sitting in here. It's not funny to her at all, because you know, there's a story an implication underneath the implication. So if life is this Twinkie that you keep on eating, then it means what? Don't trust people. It looks all good and sweet. Like you cannot trust people because it's always going to turn. There's an implication of the story. So I said I study conflict. Let me put it on conflict. Deb, right? Let's say Deb and I are in a meeting with all of you right now. And we go at it. I'm like, you know what, Deb, you need to shut up. And she's like, you need to shut up. And then we go back and forth. And we have a big problem with each other. And then you are all like, oh my gosh, this is so tense. I can't believe that this is happening. And then all of a sudden, half of you walk with her back to cubicle land or whatever. You know that someone is inevitably going to say this. Hey, Deb, what the heck's going on with Jolie? That's some crazy stuff over there, huh? She's now got to tell a little story, and she probably hasn't even thought about it. She's going to come out. I'll make it up for her to not put her on the spot. Let's say that she says this. You tell me what the context is. What if she says, oh, you know, Jody, she's like a freaking tornado. I mean, she comes in here and rips it up. She's hot one day and cold the next day. Whatever. It'll go over and she'll cool off. I'm not really worried about it. What's the context? Dealing with Jody is like what? The weather. And on a good listening day, not one of you would hear that. You wouldn't say, like, Deb, you know what? Jody's actually really cool, calm, and polite, and you're the one who needs to find a control. Actually. <laughs> no, you wouldn't hear that. You wouldn't even hear that she chose the weather zone, but your subconscious would. So you jump in the weather zone. So you'd be like, I know, it's like climate control, duh. And now she just taught you dealing with me is like dealing with the weather. And what's the implication of the weather? The weather is. Unpredictable, stormy, you have to navigate it, it can be hot and cold and change on the dime. That's what she's telling everyone about me. And that's what we're doing constantly about, that's why when you meet someone's significant other, often you're surprised because the way they talk about them does not match the way they talk about them. Most of you know what I'm talking about. I used to work with a guy named Adam. I worked at Capella University for a few years. and. Um, We'd be like, Adam, do you want to get a drink after work? And he'd be like, oh, I gotta call the old ball and chain. <laughs> like that's awkward. And then we'd be like, hey Adam, what are you gonna do this weekend? Well, let's see if I can break free the game on Sunday on my lockdown. We've got to think of the rest. <laughs> so I'll just ask the foreman. And then we'd like, oh my god, so we'd 
we met his wife, she came to an event one day. We really pictured her as a little bit big and girly and scary, and she was short and petite, and very friendly, and we were like, someone actually said, oh my gosh, you're nothing like what we thought you were. <laughs> When like someone turns around and you're like, oh, yes, drill sergeant, right? The whole family knows what that means. Or your friend group, you're like, well, aren't you the mother hen? Right? We have like these little stories that actually follow the whole behavior. So let's say that um, one of you grabs me after the meeting. Jody, what the heck's up with you and Deb? That's some crazy stuff going on. Watch how easy you can hear it when your brain's listening now. I'd say, um, oh my gosh, did you see the way Deb attacked me in that meeting? I'm not gonna sit here and like let her defeat me. I mean, what does she want me to do? Weave a white flag? Like, ooh, damn, I'm so afraid of you. Seriously, isn't she new? She's on our turf now. Yeah. <laughs> Can you hear what that was? Yeah. That was going to war, or conflict, or battle. On a good listening day, not one of you would say, actually, Joby, she's really quite peaceful. I don't know what you're talking about. You would hear it, and your brain would just jump into the story. <laughs> Did it blow over? I'm like, oh, hi, are you giving in? Is anyone speaking the same language? I don't know. I can't shut this off. And then I'm a profiler, so I can look at people and I can see so much. Okay, so um, let's just try to think about that. So Ram Das, Ram Das says, turn your melodrama, melodrama into a melodrama. Isn't that like a million dollar question? So we're going to kind of think of some strategies there. So Socrates, who I love, that had a lot of filters and he would talk about Socratic questioning and things. Or this is the way I coach my own children, so it's just something to be mindful of. Before gossiping takes off, because gossiping is a whole problem of its own, when someone brings something to you, particularly in a coaching moment with young people, you might want to stop them and say, what you're about to say to me, do you know that it's true? You know, is it good? Is it going to help anyone? Is it useful? And it just, you know, nip complaining before it starts and even coach for it in people. A lot of times people spend a lot of time complaining. I don't know about you, but I'd rather sit with people who like want to focus on the positive and do something great in the world, not complain about all the bad things in the world. So that's just something to remember. I would also say that anger is one letter short of danger. Yeah, I bet you knew that. Here's some thoughts on anger on a behavioral level. Movement will bring people to more anger. I think if you experience anger personally, don't you realize that you move more when you're angry? You flail your arms, your eyeballs go crazy. If I could write another book, I would call it Eyeballs, because eyeballs are so significant. The study of nonverbal communication through your eyes is called oculessics. I mean, if someone's lying to you, their eyeballs or pupils dilate, so get up in there and check it out. There's all sorts of things that happen with eyeballs. Her gender even, I mean, it is so amazing on what eyes alone can do. But think about it, if someone brings a problem to you and they're like, can I talk to you for a minute? Do you ever notice how their eyeballs go right to the door? Like, what, huh? Or, oh, the mail looks like, oh, are you still yelling at me? I'm gonna just check the mail then. Or they get on their phone. People love to avoid contact. Do you know even in a prison, if you walk too fast, the dog notices you? Why are you walking fast? I'm not, I'm not. I mean, movement triggers anger thoughts in people, like anger messages, like this could escalate. What does Dora the Explorer say to Swiper? Swiper knows that, and she does this. This is a universal nonverbal hand gesture. Don't forget about this gesture. When someone's starting to bring it to you or, or get excited, and they're waiting to see what your next move is, with the, keeping just a robotic to neutral face, if you put your hand up, it kind of shows them a pre-paving of what your next move is probably going to be. And this clearly says, I'm not going there with you. I'm not doing this with you. I'm not interested in that. That is a good transition into you speaking to let them know like it's probably going to be calmer than you first thought. Dora is great. Half the time, Swiper takes it. Half the time, he doesn't. Isn't that called real life? Good job, Nickelodeon. <laughs> Teach you how to show their <laughs> Some of you have seen um, that acronym for fear, false evidence appearing real. That goes back to the narratives in our head. I know people who are afraid of snakes in Minnesota. 
like they scream like a young child and run crazy, and then you're like, why are you afraid? Of, why do I want that thing to wrap itself around my neck and kill me? <laughs> See how that story is a little more dramatic than it needs to be, especially here. Um, a lot of people are afraid of cats. Yeah, remember? We are Siamese. I mean, it's all the weird stories in your head about cats that probably aren't true across the board. I remember going through a weird moment um, where I watched some murder show and they were like taking a syringe and putting air in your veins so when it hit your heart, you explode and die. And then shortly after that, I had to have an IV and there were like bubbles in the bay and I was like, now that's not gonna like go in my, um, those bubbles don't like, and then when it got an uh, empty fluid, I'm like, no, is air gonna go in that? I was like obsessing about blowing up because of these air, I mean, a thought gets in your head and that false evidence will make you crazy. You talk about racism. I was down in, um, oh, was it Fairbolt? And I stopped with my husband to get Somali food. He was like, I gotta get this. I heard it was really good. And we get out of the car and there was a white man walking with his guitar and behind him were a bunch of Somalian men talking in their native tongue, smiling, happy. They had no interest in this guy in front of him. But if you could see his face, he was like, oh, hell no, you're not going to rob me of this precious guitar. And we were like, oh, oh, this is not good. And he was kept looking back and looking back and looking back. The guys didn't even notice him. Now, thank God it all ended kind of funny because he like let his fear overcome him and he took off running, hugging his precious guitar and the guys didn't even notice him. I mean, it was kind of comical. But you see, if he would have had a fight response and turned around like, what the hell's your problem? Then he could have had a problem. It's almost like if you talk to people assuming there's a problem, you're gonna get a problem. And if you talk to people assuming that there could be a solution or if there's no problem, you probably won't go finding a problem. I've worked with people who are deemed the worst people in society, and I'm the first to tell you, they're not that bad. In fact, most people are good people. Most people want to like themselves in the mirror at the end of the day. We're only dealing with one to three percent of the population being a true sociopath. We're good, okay? We're good. A lot of that is just a bunch of hyped up stuff. Most people are good people. So, worry is using your imagination to create something you don't want. This is where I get into a mindfulness. I never understood like when it first came out, like Eckhart Tolle and being mindful and mindfully washing your dishes. I'm like, I don't have time for that. I'm like, I got milk, butter, eggs, cheese. I got to fill the soap in the bathroom and bird seed, the grandma's birthday stamps, stamps. I mean, my brain is on hyperdrive all the time, which I'm sure a lot of you can relate to. But then I put it through my filter of studying conflict. I'll show you what I got out of it if it helps at all. I asked myself, are you, is your mind full or are you being mindful? Here's where it helps get it right in your self-talk. If you really look at anger, anger is not an emotion. Anger is not on the emotional scale. Anger is a result of other emotions. So that's where I call like, oh, that's really interesting. Because what are the two things that make up the feelings underneath anger or stress? It's worried or hurt. So now you sit, if you're sitting here right now and you are worried and have anxiety, your brain is probably thinking about something in the future. Like, oh, I don't have enough money to pay my mortgage this month. I don't know what I'm gonna do. How am I gonna lose all that weight to be in that way? Oh my gosh, I have only a couple more weeks. You, you worry about something that hasn't even come yet. If your self-talk, your intrapersonal communication is stuck in the future, you can experience more worry and anxiety and then get angry at people around you. If you're sitting here right now and you're feeling hurt, your brain is probably thinking about something that's already occurred. Like, I cannot believe she said that to me. I cannot believe he did that to me. I did not deserve to. So this is where I can personally get behind mindfulness. It's like, yes, focus on the now. How do I know that I'm healthy? Because I'm here and I'm healthy and I'm breathing. And we're good, we're good, life is good. Like, let's not get too overwhelmed with stuff that goes on in our head. So I have to support mindfulness for that sake because anger really comes from those kind of thinking. As a rhetorician and someone who teaches communication, I'll remind you, do not shoot on yourself. Now you can do this to other people, but um, we do this to ourselves in our head. Here is the language that makes good people naughty. So let's put it on other people and then remind you, you're the most important to keep yourself right, then you can do good by other people. You're, a lot of you are around children. 
in your families and in the community. But let's be honest here. How many people speak to your kids like this when you get frustrated? You need to get in the car, wash your hands. No, you don't talk to me that way. Give me your iPhone. You are done. Get in your room. Okay, put your shoes on. We need to go. Oh, no, you don't talk to me that way. Don't talk to your kids like that. Like all of us? Okay, that language is the language of resistance. People say the, we hurt the ones we love the most. You've heard that, right? Here's how I say it. We should on the people we love the most. So if you want to have better integrity, here's the words to eliminate from your vocabulary. Should, shouldn't, you need to, you have to, you can't, <coughs> don't, not, stop, you ought to. It's really hard to even communicate with people without those words, right? Especially when you have to give directives, like you need to wash your hands. I've seen good preschool and kindergarten teachers, Ella, you may wash your hands. And my daughter gets up and washes her hands. I mean, it works. When you take resistance away, it's amazing how good people cannot be naughty. And it lessens the tension for naughty people. No, you're all good people, right? Let me just show you how easy it is to make good people naughty, let alone naughty people. Let's say I live in your apartment, and I go, knock, 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 and you open up the door next to mine, and I say, hi. Um, some of us actually get up and go to work in the morning. I would appreciate if you could turn your television down. Thank you. <laughs> what are you capable of right now? <laughs> murder. She said murder. She said right to murder. Do you see how you get naughty? Like, oh, I'm sorry. Maybe we'll just have a dance party in the kitchen and play in your wall tonight. And do you see how you, you, you want to be naughty? Resistance communication gets good people to get snarky. I go visit my dad. Hi, dad. I'm here to have a beer on your deck. How are you? Joe, your car's dirty. You should get a car wash. <laughs> what do I want to say to my dad right there? <laughs> you need to get a car wash. I'm like, you need to shut up. <laughs> I mean, we get a little bit like put off when people say, you should cut babies and you need to, let's not do it. So if you want to be better personally, be really hard on yourself about that language. Do not allow yourself to say those words to people. That could become a whole thing where if you have to direct people, you sit down with your work group and go, now how can we say you need to fill out these forms without saying need to? It could be a fact and then an awareness. Like fact, there are some forms that need to be filled out before you can participate. Would you like to fill them out today or do you want to take them home with you? Choices are good, right? You just want to think about the way you dialogue with people. It lessens resistance. I want to take this resistance piece a little further because it's concerning to me who deals with a lot of people who are a little more tightly wound and then they pop off and hurt people in society. Um, let me just say it this way. On a neuro-linguistic programming level, your brain cannot understand the word don't, not, and stop as a verbal command. What does that mean? That means if you were going to shove a fork in an outlet, what would someone yell to a kid? Stop! Don't! You're not going to touch! Every one of us has probably had someone in our life yell don't, not, or stop to us out of anger. And you know, children are only, humans are only born with two fears. The fear of falling and the fear of loud noises. Guess how loud a voice usually is when they use the word don't, not, or stop? Pretty loud. So it's pretty fair to say that the vast majority of us have like a reaction to those words. Like I remember when I got spanked, or I remember when I got violently removed from the area after someone yelled stop. I mean, most of us, when you hear don't, not, or stop, there's something that just triggers you whether you realize it or not. And then to add on top of that, you can't understand that. I think you know that working with kids, don't touch. What do they do? Don't run. Stop yelling at your brother! And then, I'm not! And then everyone's yelling. Your brain is no smarter than your dog on this one, okay? What if you say to your dog, no treats, bad dog, you are not, no. You see these treats? These treats are going on top of the fridge. No treats for bad dogs, no treats. What do you think the dog hears? <laughs> no, not for you, you that. Okay, see how it's ridiculous to argue with don't not stop? And this is just another thing to be mindful of, because people do it all the time. I'm not judging you or anything. I don't want you to think I'm trying to say that you need to. 
Um, don't look now, but you're never going to guess who just walked in. <laughs> I told you not to look. Why did you look? Now we're all looking over here. Or you come to a meeting. Hello, everyone, and thank you for coming to this impromptu HR meeting. Let's not panic. I don't want you to get upset. I know that there's been a lot of rumors going through our community. Uh, we are not going to be laying off a third of the workforce. And then she has a triple coronary and dies. <laughs> She didn't even know she had to worry until you started talking. I mean, this stuff is very real for anxiety in people. You're flicking through the channels. I did not have sexual relations with that woman. I did not have sexual, 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 sexual relations. What did everyone in the whole world picture at that moment? Sexual relations with any of that micro expression that showed he was lying? Really? That was a great moment. What did Nixon say? Nixon said, I'm not a crook. And you remember that. Because that's how significant your brain gets in towards don't and not. You cannot turn this off. In fact, watch, I'll just show you. Please do not picture your favorite ice cream in a see-through dish on the table in front of you. Oh my gosh, it's running down the side. It's going to hit your pant leg. Please do not picture the layout of your kitchen and where the stove is and the refrigerator. <laughs> and the you see how it's really hard to get on? And, and I don't know about you, but if you've ever been like, trying to get parking, like at the U of M, I have to pay $12 a day just to go to work. God forbid I find a parking ramp and it's not game day, and I don't hit you on your bike and you walking. I mean, it's a lot of stress to just navigate. And then all of a sudden you get to a parking ramp, and then it's like, available? Guess what word they throw up? Not, okay, try to process that phrase while you're all stressed out. Not available. You're like, is it available? I mean, it says ava available. Available. You always turn in. <laughs> It messes with people's brains when you use the word don't and not. It's really a good idea to just eliminate that from your language. If I may just add one more layer, just so we can be a little bit real about where society's heading, especially as educators, my gosh, we can change this. Um, I'm really concerned with the rhetoric, the presidential rhetoric. Who cares about what you think about the president? His rhetoric is a certainty tone, right? People who use a certainty tone rub a lot of people wrong. So it doesn't mean their intentions aren't necessarily bad, but a tone of certainty in your, red, in your rhetoric is going to sound like this. Do you know what your problem is? You drink too much of that coffee. That's what your problem It's diagnosing. It's should you not, you need to, you have to, we can't, no, stop, don't, you ought to. That is the tone of resistance, is the tone of certainty. Unfortunately, we have a lot of leaders using that now, and it's not helping people calm down. It's making good people get a little wound tight, and it's never a good thing. That, in my opinion, coupled with suggested sales, is becoming the downfall of America. Oh my gosh, I really believe we gotta get behind this. Let me show you how stressful a daily life is for most of you here that you probably have never thought about because of certainty and because of suggested sales. This is you. You wake up. I'm going to change the world and help people and I'm going to make a difference. I need my Starbucks or Caribou or whatever. So you go to the coffee house. Hi, I'll take a vanilla latte. That's it. Can I interest you in a scone then? Something from the bakery? No, I'm good. Just the latte. Would you like to buy a five pound bag of beans? <laughs> no, I'm good. I'll just um, take the coffee. Um, do you have a rewards card? <laughs> no. Would you uh, like to donate to Susan G. Or <laughs> okay, you know what? I'm, I'm freaking stressed. I'm stressed out. Um, tomorrow, I'll just get my coffee at Quick Trip. <laughs> and then you go to Quick Trip and you're like, hey, here's my debit card for gas and coffee. Do you have a rewards card? <laughs> No, I don't. Well, they're free. Yeah, I know. I come here like every other day. Well, you can earn points. <laughs> I got that. I got that. Did you want a car wash today? Did you, did you like your receipts? Well, you know what? I'm going to get a Keurig. And I'm my own coffee. And then I'm going to dance around my house with my head right because I like the happy life. I still need gas. But I hate people. So I'm standing at the back of the machine. How many questions does the machine ask me? And then you get all worked up, and then you go to work, and the first sentence out of some co-worker's mouth is, we need you to sign that. Now you be sure. I can't be waiting. You have to get that. We need to. Okay, is everyone listening? Please be, don't talk. And you're like, wow. My co-workers are so annoying.
wait, I'm co-working out on a cheeseburger. So then you're like, um, hi, I'll take a cheeseburger and a Diet Coke, that's it? Would you like to add a fry on then? <laughs> no, just the burger. Well, if you get a fry, it's actually cheaper. <laughs> oh, I'm good. Would you like to order two apple pies for a dollar? <laughs> you see how it just gets crazier and crazier and crazier? The question in my mind is like, at what point does a good person have the right to pop off at someone? I mean, you, you understand why like, people are going home and like kicking their dogs or doing sports or drinking heavily? I mean, do you see there's so much resistance rhetoric everywhere you go? And then you've got people who are like, don't not stop, you can't. When do people get to just relax and have no stress in their life? I mean, this is really, you know where it happened for me? And I'm fairly like, I got my head right. I know how to be calm. This is where it happened for me. I sell my books when I talk at big conferences. I have a bunch of checks in my car, and I don't always get to the bank. So I finally go through. And you know, I got stuff going on in my car. I'm putting on makeup, I'm eating lunch, I'm putting on my, so, right? I got, I'm on the phone, and I usually go through the teller, and she or he would always say, thank you, Joey, and it's done. This one particular day when I was already stressed out, I put all my checks through, and I have good penmanship, by the way, and it said deposit slip. Okay, this is not hard, right? I sent it through. The gal goes, so, Joey, are we depositing all these checks then? And then they keep wanting to do excuses. I'm like, be a verb. 
I'm like, what? I'm like, get that. Fine. And then I walk away. So like when I had a stomach surgery at one point, I got a card from a bunch of students that said, be a verb, get healthy. I mean, I really do say be a verb a lot, but it kind of cuts to the chase. Like, I don't care about the excuses. I don't care about the drama. Let's just do it. Let's just get it done. Like, let's not worry about why and can't fix the past kind of thing. So if you want to stick with that language or that context, usually there's you and your life I would just say most people can think of a noun in their life, a person, place, or thing, that is just the problem. So that's where you want to, it, that's how easy it can be if you get your head right, like, oh, I can't handle all the stress in my life. Well, all you have to do is be looking at the nouns. Who's the person, place, or thing that is keeping me away from living the life I want? And then that's what you deal with, and you be a verb. Now that might be incredibly simple, but for those of you who struggle in a hamster wheel or tread water and can't move forward, it might be real simple to think about it that way to tackle the problem. Okay, so what kind of, oh, all right, so I want to show you like language moves or it doesn't move. My gosh, I love language. So up here, I'm just trying to show you. If you use verbs, it usually creates action in people. If you use nouns or adjectives, it might get people to calm down. Now you can read the examples that's on here. I also put business cards on the table. For anyone who wants a copy of these, I'd be happy to send them to you. Maybe I can even get them to one person if you have all the emails. But um, what I'm saying is, without even reading what's on the screen, let's say that you want to deal with some difficult situation and you're stressing out about it and you're like, I don't know how to approach this person. Let's say that it's two people in your meeting who always talk, but they're good people and you don't really want to make it a big deal, but they are so annoying because they always talk during your meeting. If you grab these two people to talk to them and you use a pronoun, like you two are very rude and you were interrupting the meeting and you were loud. So if you start using like pronouns and verbs, they're gonna get defensive real quick. But look what happens when you eliminate pronouns like you, we, I, and then you, you turn down the language. It could be like, can I talk to you for a minute? The constant talking during the meeting has become an issue. See how there's really no fight in that? The constant talking has become an issue. They're less likely to rebuttal if you use language that's instead, do you think people are smart enough to understand the constant talking equals your big mouth? Yeah, people are really smart. But it's just a nicer way to do business with people. So it's like a mindful thing again. It's a choice thing. So what are some words that I like instead of the naughty words? First of all, in your own head, have you ever noticed that you can become a victim pretty quick? Or you can empower yourself pretty quick? There is a word that triggers that, which you might not have looked at. What did Yoda say about oh, try? Do do or do not. There is no try. In other words, try is a lot. Try, if you say you're trying, you're lying. Like, I don't even use this on kids. You know how, like, kids will say, I tried, I can't, I'm afraid. I wouldn't even let my kids say that because then society teaches us as long as you use the language, I tried, then you can't get mad at me for not following through on my accountability. Hey, babe, are you coming to my grandma's 80th birthday party? Yeah, I'll try. Are they coming? Are they coming? They're not coming. But because they said they tried, you're not allowed to get mad at them. So I'd say you're either doing or not doing. Same thing as Yoda, but he said it cooler. People who use the word try are kind of excuse makers. So if you're one of those people, just be mindful of it. The word can't and don't, for some reason in your intrapersonal communication, one is limiting and one is empowering. Have you ever noticed if you say, I can't lose weight, or why can't I ask him out, or why can't I just ask for a raise? you will lay down and be a victim. But then when you get stubborn with yourself, you're like, why don't I just lose weight? How hard is it? I know how to do this. I've done it a hundred times before. Why don't I just ask him out? Why don't I just ask for a raise? I deserve it. The minute you start empowering your self-talk with why don't you, you can find your courage. That's just something to know. And you can use this when you coach other people, where they're like, I can't do it. Well, why don't you? You're good. You can turn around someone else's complaining with that language. So, um, maybe I'll wait on. Let me give you some words I like. One, I'll give you three, my top three words for reducing stress. And I think that's all you really need unless you do another training on 101 ways to decrease craziness. But 
But here's my top three words. One I learned from an offender at the Rush City facility when um, I was conducting a class, and he would not shut up. He came in with, oh, so this is a bunch of crap, and he was on fire. And I kind of took a Taoist approach, like, we'll just let a whirlwind whirl itself out. Can't last for too long, can it? Oh, it can. <laughs> <laughs> two hours later, he is still going crazy. Nobody cares. In that kind of a facility, it's kind of like normal. They don't care. You know when they cared? They cared when I said, okay, you guys, tonight we're going to do some homework in class. So you're going to at your tables, work on it, put your name on it, and then you're going to get your grade for your group effort. That's when they cared. All of a sudden, a couple guys up here were like, shh. You've all seen this go down too. Do you know it goes down the same way in a kindergarten classroom as it does in a meeting like this, as it does in a prison? Except for the prisoners get up quicker, like, what did you say? And then they get thrown in a hole for three weeks and that was part of it. I mean, they're just quicker to pop off. But it's the same thing. And the rule is, if I don't take care of business, guess who takes care of business? It's the same everywhere. Have you seen that when someone's conducting a meeting, two people are talking, up here they'll be like, shh, and they look at the facilitator. If the facilitator's like, they'll take care of business. They'll be like, would you guys shut up? Some of us actually want to hear what she has to say. Mm. And they're like, mm, she doesn't care about really that. I mean, have you not seen this go down? It happens in every context. So I realized really quickly, these guys are looking at him, and they're like, shh. I'm like, oh my gosh, I know this rule. If I don't take care of business, and it's going to go, and I've seen this, and I'm not, no, we're not doing this. So I try every teacher trick I know. First trick, stop talking. I bet a lot of you use that, right? As soon as you stop talking, where, where do the talkers look? At you, are you looking at us? Yeah, so shut up. I mean, that works really well. That didn't work. Next strategy I use. When I'm handing things out and I get over to his table, I get right up next to him. And I don't look at him or acknowledge him. He's still talking. I'm like, okay, you guys. Put your name on your handout and you're going to have about 25, this is like, shut up, yeah, you. And when you're in someone's proximity, it usually works, I bet you know that. But just remember, if you um, have people who are talking, if you slowly walk towards them without acknowledging their existence, and then you hang out right next to them, they'll shut up, usually. And then you walk away, and they start talking again, then you go back, and they're like, oh my god, do you do that? Because like, yes, so shut up, I mean, it's like a really nice way to get people to comply. I mean, do you remember what I said in the beginning? You don't always have to diffuse people anymore. You just confuse them and dial it down. It's not worth the big battle. The word I'm trying to show you in that sentence is prefer. That's your new favorite word. I would prefer that there's little to no talking. We have a lot of things to go over in the next 20 minutes. That's nice, right? That's a nice way to say shh. Prefer. You can be terse with it. But it's not like, you need to be quiet. I, I would like you to be more, we can't be, what are you, a Nazi? Like, be nice, be nice to people. So prefer could be your new favorite word. I would prefer you don't sucker punch your brother in the face. I would prefer that we go to this restaurant, actually. Prefer is a good word. I'd say use it. Most people will not go off with that word. There's two other words that I really like that I would like you to remember. Marshall Rosenberg talked about nonviolent communication in the early 1990s. He also did those weird puppet shows. For those of you who read his work, he was kind of different. But I like his rhetoric stuff. He did a lot of nation to nation stuff that we don't need to get into here. But on a communication level, he said most people are pretty mild to neutral with the words uh, feeling and need, and in that order. Now you probably are like, yeah, I've heard that. No, let me apply it for you and make you think a little bit. And then you might tattoo them on your wrist because it's such a great set of words. There's not a place you can't use this. In fact, the Chinese symbol for, um, it's not conflict, what is it? I don't know the actual word, it just escaped me. I'll think of it at 3 a.m. Oh my god. The Chinese word for something like conflict is danger and opportunity superimposed. What is the word? We'll have to Google it. But isn't that beautiful? Crisis, thank you. I knew someone would know. Here's this part of the skirt. Okay, danger and opportunity superimposed for the word crisis. This is such an excellent tattoo, right? We should have that tattooed on our body. At any given moment, someone could bring you a danger or you could turn it into an opportunity to better someone, right? I mean, this is where it goes. Feeling need is the set of language you need. So let's do this across the board. Most of you have a child somewhere in your life. Okay, 
I have a daughter, Ella. And when Ella was going, I had two girls. When Ella was going through, um, I called it a tactile dysfunction phase. I'm sure one of you knows the actual name for this phase. But you know when it's like, my teeth hurts my back. My socks hurt my feet. Do you know what I'm talking about here? Yes. Okay, so there's a word I'm sure for that. I called it a tactile dysfunction phase. Because she was so irritating. I'd have to cut all the tees off her sleep dresses and everything rubbed her the wrong way. It's so irritating. So one day we're getting ready to leave. And I'm like, Ella, let's go. We're running late. She's like, Mom, my socks hurt my feet. I'm like, no, they don't. Let's get in the car. Mom, Mom, my socks hurt my feet. I'm like, Ella, we need to go. Like, let's go. She throws her socks in my face. Like, Mom, my socks hurt my feet. You see how you want to use one of those naughty words there? Like, you need to get in the car. You can't. That's it. You're done. Stop. You see why you just want to go nuts? You could do this. Ella. Sounds like you're feeling a little frustrated with your socks. Do you need me to help you? No! Do you need me to get you another pair? No! Okay, well, I'll be in the kitchen, you know, drinking heavily. Let me know. <laughs> <laughs> Children that you can abandon before you lose it. Let's do another one. Um, 
You could even divert away from some, you know when I said, what do you do if someone brings it to you or puts it on you and you're like, oh, I want to deal with this right now. If it's not a crisis, there's no rule that says you have to handle their problem right now. So you could say, wow, I'm feeling really concerned about what you just told me and I need some time to look into it. Could we meet after the two o'clock meeting and regroup on this? Most people are not gonna get mad about that, right? They even maybe respect you for looking into it or processing it, but maybe it's a way to divert away from anxiety in the moment. Let me give you a way to call out your team members or colleagues or people that you work with and wanna keep a nice relationship so you don't have any stress. You could do this. Um, can I talk to you for a minute? And they're like, eh, I would. Um, I was feeling really frustrated in the meeting this morning because you were rolling your eyes at me and I need to know that we're on the same page when we roll out these new policies. No, we're in Minnesota. Let's switch that up a little. Um, <laughs> Minnesota's got to be a little nicer. That's not going to work here. It'll work in other states. Here's how Minnesota will do. Minnesota will do feeling need, multiple choice questions you can know how to think, I'll give you some bohemian fruits so you can just grab it. And then uh, we'll all have a hot dish. <laughs> That's Minnesota. So here's a better way to do it. Can I talk to you for a minute? And they're like, uh, what? I was feeling really frustrated in the meeting this morning because you were rolling your eyes at me. And I need to know that we're on the same page when we roll out these new policies. So I just wanted to check in with you. Um, did you have a question? Or did I say something to offend you? Or am I reading you wrong? Or... See how they're just gonna grab one? Oh, um, I'm sorry, I'm just not feeling well. Did you want me to apologize to the whole group? No, I'm just checking in with you. Now when you check in with the person, are you vibrating as a problem or vibrating as a solution? Solution. Because if you go vibrating like, what the hell's wrong with you? Guess what you're gonna get? Rebuttals and a lot of excuses. But if you go vibrating, I don't know if I'm going to work for that as a solution, like, hey, I just want to check in and see if we have an issue to solve, then it usually goes your way. So the vibration or your intention piece is super important if you're going to use that. So I think we got that feeling of need. Can you get behind that language? It's good language. It's good language. Okay, just don't be snarky. Like, I'm feeling overwhelmed and you need to shut up. Don't get out of So anyway, here's some other words that you might want to consider. Oh, I better watch my time. So you stress, spelled with the EU, means positive stress, right? Like the stress you feel before your wedding or before the big game. That's a good kind of stress that's pretty healthy, like revved up for the school year. That's a good stress. Most people are in it for the good reasons. So I say, how do you go from you stress to you stress? Well, here's some language ideas that might help you coach people, but then most importantly, do it yourself. Um, I'm at a point as an educator where um, I have completely taken charge of who I am in the classroom. When I first started my career, right in front of my face on the first day, students used to say, do you have to take this class? Yeah, I do, I need it for my major. Oh, this class sucks. I'm like, wow, I'm standing right here, God, yes. <laughs> and it was like, I have to take this class. Do you know how not fun it is to teach a bunch of students who have to take your class? I mean, it is not fun, okay? Over the years, something started happening. Like, hi, Jody, I know so-and-so, he's in my fraternity. Um, I would like to take your section. And I'd be like, wow, that's weird. There's 46 sections, three of which are at the same time as mine. And the student went out of his way to find my email and asked me, that's cool. And then I started getting the students who would choose to be in my classes. Then life started getting a little bit better for me. They actually listened to me and participate. I'm finding a point in my career where I have a waiting list of up to 60 people per section. I mean, you can't even get through that many. And it's like, did you get her? Oh, I got her. Oh, my God. I get to have her. You know how fun it is to teach a room of 26 students who get to be in your class? So I'm finally thankful for that moment. I worked really hard to keep that because, God, it's for my own sanity. But once in a while, one of those have-tos will sneak in there. I'm actually in a position which many of you are not in because students in college can drop and take another section, and there's 46 of them to choose from. I'll coach you right now on the first day <laughs> for my own health, and I'll just show you what I mean. People are looking to be victims a lot. You know how you catch a victim? This is how I catch a victim, first day of class. Yeah, did you have a question? Um, do we have to do a typed outline for that first presentation? Uh oh, he just asked me a question. It had the word have in it. 
What does he want me to say? Yes, you need to. Yes, you have to. He wants me to shoot on him in the first 10 minutes class. And then if I say, yes, you need to do that, what is he going to say all the home? She's making us say, oh, no, oh, no, no, you're not going to make me into that teacher, and I'm not going to let you be a victim. It's the first day of class, and I'm kind of fun. Like, chill out and see if you like it first, right? So watch how I do business. If you knew me, I am the dumbest, most dingiest professor, and so nice until it's time not to be. And I've learned, like, dumb and dingy wins. So here's what I do. Oh, thank you for that question. If you have that question, I bet everyone does. And they're like, oh, it's pretty wide eyed Okay. Well, let's go through this. Uh, my syllabus says, um, when we get to the presentations, if you choose to do the presentation, it's worth 60 points. And if you choose to accompany it with a typed um, handout outline, it'll be another 60. Yep. So do, do we need to do one then? Oh, I'm sorry. I thought my syllabus was clear here. Um, let me just go through it so everybody's on the same page. If you choose to turn in a typed outline to accompany, then you're choosing to get the points. Um, what is she saying, you guys? Because I, I have a, like, you're out of here. You're out of here. Done, I'm done. Get you out. And I have. I've had those really awkward moments for my own sanity and for theirs because they want someone who will shut on them. It's part it's called control drama, right? There's a whole training we can do on that. I'm not going to be the best teacher for this guy anyway. So I'll take him after class and I'll be like, hey, I noticed that maybe our communication styles are different. And I just wanted to remind, remind you that there's um, 46 other sections of this class and I would not take it personally if you choose to, you know, drop it. And all the teachers said that to you, would you out of there? Yeah, they do. They're like, I'm terrified of her. And then they drop, <laughs> and then I get to let a get-to person get in on my waiting list. And then I'm good for five months. No, that is pretty awesome, right? I'm at a point where I will never be a leader again. I will never be a boss again. I spent my whole 20s and 30s being a department chair, a college registrar, um, leading groups of director student services. Are you kidding me? Why would you want to be a leader? All you do is deal with other people's problems. Really? You got problems? Get in line. I got okay. okay. <laughs> so anyway, do you see how you can coach people with this? This is how you coach even, let's just look at this. Um, kids, listen, kids, listen, the neighbors invited us over. I'm so excited because they're so nice that I, but you know what? you're going to need to have your manners on. Now, they are from another country, another culture. I don't know if you've ever tried the food they're going to serve you. You're going to eat it. Do you understand me? Now, I don't care if it looks funny or different. Be polite, and you're going to eat it, okay? Do you understand me? Is that kid going to eat it? You see how they're like, I'm not eating that crap. <laughs> they haven't been there yet. See how you can create resistance to people on the front end? We have to meet before Christmas break to update the policy and procedure guide. Who wants to go to that meeting? <laughs> we need to get this done. See how you can't really encourage people around this language? What if you say to your kids, hey you guys, listen, the neighbors invited us over and they're serving that food that mommy really likes. I don't know if you've tried it or not, but um, I think you will. Can you, listen, could you have some manners tonight? Now sometimes it's scary to try new things, but could you just try something on your plate? Just to give it a try and show that you have manners and could you do that? See how they're like, hmm, probably not. But there's less resistance there. What if you coach your kids on the front end and be like, oh my gosh, guess what? The neighbors invited us over and they get to, we get to eat that food. You get to come too. It's that food that mom really likes. You get to eat it too. I'm so excited. See how that kid's probably going to eat all the food and not even think there was some problem to have? So you might want to say like, you know what, you guys, we have a couple days, this this calendar, you're at home, like, talking to your world and you're like, we might have a chance to get this done ahead of schedule. That's how you motivate people. They get to do it. They don't have to do it. But the medium ground is always you can choose to do it. So that I do that when I have a potential problem with a student. Like I'll teach a night class and the student will be like, Joey, oh my gosh, hold on. Oh, I know your class starts in like five minutes, but I have to go to work and I'm supposed to present tonight. You're not going to take points off my presentation, are you? contact me within 24 hours of a schedule, you know, and then you're going to lose this many percentage points. Jody, oh my gosh, I, okay, this, I'm, I'm a really good student, like I'm on the E on roll, I am not a freaking lazy loser, look, 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 see, see, I have to go to work, I have to go to work, that's why I'm here, so you wouldn't think I was bad. I'm like, I don't think you're bad. No, you don't understand, 
I have to go to work. And then I'd say, well, then you should choose to go to work. No, Jody, I'm not choosing to go to work. I have to. I want to be in your class, but and that's fine. I've made a lot of choices in my life, too. I understand. No, Jody, I don't want to get it. Okay, hold on, hold on, hold on. You're at like an 80. And I'm going to take away this percentage of this many little points. Is that really going to affect you? Yeah, it's not like I'm failing, right? No, not at all. You know, I've made a lot of tough choices, and sometimes you just have to, yeah, it's not like I'm going to fail, right, Jody? Yeah, you're fine. I can do it next week. Yeah, you can choose to do it next week and get the points and dismiss. Oh, shit, I'm late for work. Bye, Jody. God, you're the best. <laughs> now I'm a cool teacher because I didn't shoot on you and be like, yes, you need to take the consequence. Everything becomes a choice, and then people become more accountable, and people become more responsible. When you give people the choice, you give them the power, and then everyone equals out, and it's really easy to do business with them. So it's like, if you choose to speak to me that way again, I'm going to need to call security, and I mean, that's why I talk in the prisons. I'm going to get mad. And then after they take him away, if some guy's like, I cannot believe he spoke to you that way. I'm like, well, he chose to do that, so he chooses to miss our awesome class, and then they'll laugh. Not normal, right? I'll go home and eat big chips or something, but let's just say in the moment it helps. So there is this whole thing about tolerate versus allow. Now I just want to make a clarification here, just on the connotation of, you know, words have meanings, because um, there's a lot of trendy books, and I'm, I read a ton. In fact, Berkeley is leading the research in um, bliss, the the research of happiness, and I bet a lot of you have read books. Like, what's who knows the number one self-ranked country for happiness? Who is it? Yeah, Denmark. So Denmark has been self-rated number one. Are we on that list, by the way? No, we are not. So um, probably my favorite book related to all this, and there's many books out there, great research, is the one called The Geography of Bliss. It will make you think. So the researcher basically used to do uh, war-torn reporting countries, and then he had a moment in his career where he's like, wow, I like to travel, but I only get to go to the bad countries with all this drama. I want to go to the good countries and travel. So he went to Berkeley, I believe, and he said, who are the top 10 self-rated countries? I want to go visit them. And being a journalist, he couldn't help himself. He turned it into a book and everything. But what he did is he spent like a month or more in each country, and he talked to the people. And he said, why are you happy to live here? What makes you happy? And then what he did is he did what we did earlier. He listened to everyone's stories, and he heard the root metaphor of the whole country, and then he turned it into, people in Switzerland are happy because, and their word was efficiency. That was his root metaphor. I know that the train will be on time. I can eat off of a public restroom floor. It's so clean. We have Swiss army knives, and we don't even have an army. We have a Swiss banking system. I mean, everything about Switzerland that the people said they were happy about was efficiency. So the book makes you think, would I be happier if my life was more, I mean, it's a good read just to get you thinking about what makes you happy. Um, Iceland's on the list. The book metaphor comes down to something about create, creative expression, mostly in the form of poetry at a bar with vodka in your friends. <laughs> Okay, if I could creatively express myself drinking with my friends, would I be happy? Yeah, I think I could do that. Okay, Denmark's word was, I'm happy to live in Denmark because people are tolerant. And the only reason I want to clarify that is the way I'm using the word tolerant is not the way the people in Denmark use it. I think what, if they were being more accurate on the meaning side of the word, people in Denmark meant to say, or the author meant to say, People allow me to do me, and then you can do you, and we're all good. I think that's what they meant. So a lot of people, when they hear tolerate, it's like, I'm nice to you on the outside, but then I go home and I have an altar. That's not what I mean by tolerate um, in the books that we just talked about. But on the screen up here, that is what I mean. If you get into a mindset of, like, I have to tolerate you, you're going to have a problem with people. I used to have a boss back in the day who, she wouldn't put anything on the intra, what do they call that, the intra, but web that's internal, what's that called? Intranet, yeah. So we'd be like, hi Kathleen, I need a time off form. And she'd be like, oh, sit down. I am so overworked and underpaid. I'm going to tell you about it for the next 20 minutes. And you'd be like, oh my gosh. And you would appease her. Like, oh, you poor thing. You work so hard. They don't respect you. I mean, she would suck you into the drama. The whole time, guess what you're thinking? Who cares? Who cares? Who cares? Why don't you put this thing online? This is so inefficient, right? So you would tolerate her. And then after a while, you learn, like, it is what it is. 
I hate that sentence badly, but anyway, it is what it is. So you learn to allow it, and then you get normal in your head. Like, well, I need to go to lunch, but I'm not going anywhere today, so I'll go get my form, and that can't take more than 25 minutes, right? So I'll still get another half hour, so okay, good. And then she starts talking, and then you're like, there she goes, she's a bulldog. Yep, here we go. And you can have fun with it. If you allow things to occur as they're occurring, you'll have less stress, but if your brain starts tolerating it, that's where a lot of problems come up. So, allow versus tolerate. Here's some language I would suggest. Remember earlier I said don't shoot on yourself? And then some people might go, well, what do I say to myself then? Well, maybe you talk to yourself the way that you talk to your friends. Like, I can figure this out. I don't need to know the answer today. I am smart. Let's make a pro and con list. Okay, this is fine. Like, I've handled worse than this. It's everything you would normally say to your friend, but I'm just asking you to turn it on yourself, because again, if you can calm down, then hopefully you can calm other people down. So look at your choices. I will say that the research talks a lot about positive pivoting. There's a whole new uh, genre in psychology called positive psychology. Like you can get a master's degree, maybe even a doctorate in that now. It's right on the leading edge of quantum physics and everything, and I love it. But um, they do a lot around positive pivoting. If you're someone who really gets in a rut, I don't know why it works. I will tell you, you have to do it for 38 seconds in order to shift into the next thought in your brain. Why? I couldn't even tell you. But um, 30, I do do this, by the way, and it's goofy, but it works. Like, um, let me tell you how it works. Do you know how if you have to go to a family holiday, and even like a couple weeks out, you're like, oh, I do not want to go to my brother's house. His wife is so annoying, and she's probably not going to put towels out, and I'm not going to know what to eat, and oh, her kids are out. You know why you just start that little narrative, like, I don't want to deal with her, and I don't want to deal with him, and they're so, and then you're not even there yet, and you have all this drama that's building up. This is how you get yourself to be mindful of catching yourself telling negative stories before it happens, and then to get yourself right again, you positively pivot for as long as you can hold it. Now, I live in Duluth, and I work at the U of M down here. I got a lot of drive time, okay? And I also listen to like two books every day on Audible, so I are really smart. I try. Okay, so I gotta get over that um, stress of it all. So here's what I do. Sometimes when I'm driving, I do this. I can keep it going for like 20 minutes, and it's goofy, you don't wanna do this around people. And it works. Like, try it. I really, so there's some prompts up there. All you do is you tell a story out loud about everything that makes you happy, and you don't lie to yourself. So you can't say like, oh, it feels so good to win the lottery. No, you didn't win it, liar, so don't get excited. <laughs> you can't lie to yourself. You just have to be like, um, get your head right. You're like, you know what? I am feeling good. The sun is out today. I have been drinking more water. You know, it feels good to drink water. You know, it feels really good to do what I love and get paid for it and meet a bunch of great people. I am impacting people every day. I get to be a role model. I can choose to be a, you know what, I love that new doubt comforter I got. It is so soft. It was totally worth the money. You just talk about your pets and your kids. And oh, I can't wait actually for Thanksgiving because I'll get to see my brother. And you know, I love when the grandkids are all together and I love taking family pictures and it's so fun to have the cousins hang out. That's what you do. You just say the positives and then once you start, in an emotional level, it, it really is like a high, so you just keep going until you get goofy and then you hope no one's recording it. Yeah, okay. So another thought. Oh, every spiritual tradition says, turn the other cheek. And a lot of people get offended by this, um, especially aggressive people. They're like, why? So you can punch me on the other side of the cheek? Do you know why I love this saying? It, it resonates on such a deeper level. Um, does anyone know what Mother Teresa said when they asked her if she would march against the war in Vietnam? What did she say? She said she would never um, march against something, but if you want to be for something. Yeah, so she said, I will never march against anything, but if you walk for peace, I'll be there. Oh my gosh, that was such a profound thought. Such a profound thought. In other words, do you see how society is kind of crazy right now? Anytime you push against something, which again is resistance, all that language we talked about is resistance, standing against something is resistance. I and mean, we're back in the 50s on racism because we're fighting racism. You can't fight anything and expect it to go away. Remember when Nancy Reagan was like, this is your brain, this is your brain on drugs. Any questions? 
you do realize that we did not have a drug problem in the United States until she started talking about the war on drugs, and then drugs blew up, and then all of a sudden we, I mean, really think about it. When you fight bullying in schools, what happens? Everybody starts by bully, 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 oh, you're bullying. Oh my gosh, I get tons of calls as a conflict and negotiation professor. Um, hi, Jody. can you come and talk to us about how to talk to Somalians? Okay, that question is your problem. Hi, Jody. can you come and talk to us about aggressive uh, preteen boys? Yep, that question is your problem. Hi, Jody. Um, could you talk Could you talk to us about anti-bullying campaign? Uh-oh. Nope, I will never come there. But if you want to know how to teach peace, I'll be happy to do that in your school. Now, I know a lot of you probably deal with bullying. You've got to change the language of that. You can't focus on fighting bullying and think it's going to go away. It'll just blow up before your very eyes. And we're seeing that. In fact, people are like, hey, I hate these people. I'm going to start a Facebook page, and you should like it. And then we'll all hate them. And then we'll just beat that drum until it gets bigger and bigger. And we'll just stop it by getting bigger and resisting it. No, it just grows. You know, I teach at Fond du Lac Tribal and Community College two days a week up in Cocaine, and my best friend is an Anishinaabe guy named Everett. And him and I just were talking about how that whole movement took place when they were protecting the pipeline. This is why it was so confusing. Nobody fought anything, ever. Or they didn't say they were warriors. What did they say? Peacemakers, water. Your water protectors. And nobody knew what to do because they were like, we got to, you're fighting for, no, we're not fighting for anything, we're just protecting. And it's just weird how, like, nobody even gave it coverage because they didn't know what to do with it. So um, when I teach in the prisons especially, I make the guys, and I do say guys because they're mostly men, um, write a paper. And the title of their paper has to be, tell me what you stand for. And it's a whole learning opportunity because guess what they all write about? What they stand against. I hate these people, I hate who, I hate when they do that, I don't like, I'm not going to put up with, oh, well that's what you don't want, so what do you stand for? Do you stand for like brotherhood, or humility, or your family, what do you stand for? No, I hate people who are, well what do you stand for? And then I look at their tattoos, and there's a lot of resistance going on, and a lot of times what people think about, they put on their arms and things, right? So it's a whole learning exercise to then talk about, and then I make them rewrite the paper, taking the opposite of what they don't want and turn their other cheek and say, thank you for showing me what I don't want my whole life. Now I'll turn the other cheek and look at what I do want, and then I'll stand for that. That could be a good activity for some of you, right, to do with your people. But um, I'll say, maybe you've got to ask yourself that. Like, what do you stand for when you're on in front of a group of people? Instead of, I'm not willing to put up with, and you can't use your cell phones, and you have to listen, and no talk. Maybe you say what you stand for, which I know educators are good at. What are our rules, and what do we want to see? But that's something to remember, turning the other cheek. I think conflict's good. Here's my opinion on conflict. We live in a world of resistance and diversity, because if everyone were the same, God, that would be boring. And then you come up against something you don't want or don't like, and your job is to go, thank you for teaching me what I don't like to eat or don't like to do or what kind of boss I don't want to be. Thank you for helping me understand what I do want. So now I'll just turn my other cheek and go for it. But you see people like, oh, look at her. What a lazy loser, seriously. And you're like, I thought you got divorced like eight years ago. I know, but look at her. She's just still in the same rut. Wow, you've been looking at her for eight years. How was the last eight years then? You could have been like, thank you for showing me what is unhealthy for me. Good luck to you. I'm going to turn my, oh, could you be her? You could be the next one. You could be the next one. But instead, they obsess about what they don't want or didn't like for eight years, and they stress themselves out. Something to think about. OK, so take a peaceful stance. I just thought of a few things that I've actually said to people that have worked for me. And all these are kind of lame, but they work, so that's good. So here is one of them. Remember earlier, I'm glad that you're upset because it shows that you care. I use that on my kids all the time. Do Mom, I'm dumb. I don't understand math. Mom, I don't get it. And then my Nina will take off and go and cry and lock herself in a room and have a big fit. And I wait till she calms down and I'll be like, actually, Nina, I'm really proud of you. It shows that you care about your math. You know, when I was your age, I just didn't even do my math. I was kind of like not like you. The fact that you're getting upset shows me that you care about your education. I am so proud of you. And then she'll be like, I thought I was going to get in trouble, right? So you can reframe it. Caring is a nice way. Um, just remember what we just said. It's okay to think about what you don't want as long as you can pivot it into thank you, what I don't want, now what do I want? Remember to make the pivot. Um, 
That character building is one of those confuse them statements. I use it on 18 to 22 year olds a lot. Because you know when you get older, you go through like deaths in the family and traumatic events and you see abuse and things that you never saw when you were younger on a more global level, do you know what I mean? And then little things don't bug you as much. Well, when you're 18 to 23, at least in my experience, everything's drama. Like, oh my God, my car got told my dad's gonna kill me and then they just lose it. I'm like, I think you'll make it. You know, it's hard. But I mean, it's hard to coach people through things that are really not that big of a deal and then watch them go nuts. So how I have deflected from people who maybe I don't need to help them spark their drama is I will have a student who's like, Jody, you're never gonna believe this. Remember how my backpack was stolen? Well, now guess what happened? And then they bring in other dramatics. I don't even know these people. They're just students who like run a vent. I'll go like this. Wow, if this keeps up, you're gonna build some good character this month. <laughs> Like what? <laughs> well, you've been through a lot. You're gonna have some strong. This is like a good character building moment. God, you're weird. <laughs> but I mean, it's kind of a nice way to say like I'm really not gonna keep talking about this with you, but I'm trying to spin it to the positive. It's just like if my brother calls me as his older sister, he's like, my boss is such a jerk. You're never gonna believe what she did. He's kind of always the victim because I'm his older sister. If he calls my younger sister, he's like, I'm the man and my job is awesome. You know how you just have different sibling relationships? So she gets the good side of him on that. I get the, and in his metaphor for conflict, which I've never made him to know because my family thinks I'm a speech teacher. And I am, but there's a little more to it. So anyway, what my brother does as a good metaphor is animalistic behavior. My brother thinks conflict is equal to animalistic behavior. You know how I know that? Because he says stuff like this. Oh my God, my boss like told me to rip my face off. <laughs> she like backed me in this corner and I was like, wow, your job sounds stressful. <laughs> but every time he talks about drama at work, he uses animalistic metaphors. And I bet it really is really that way for him. So no wonder he has so much stress. He could change that, but I'm not a therapist. Okay, so anyway, when he calls me and he's like, oh my gosh, you're never gonna believe what a jerk, right? You know what I do? Instead of doing that whole, what we said with Socrates, letting him complain and gossip, I hand it back to him. I say, oh my gosh, what are you gonna do? No, seriously, she is such a jerk. She was like, da 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 da. What are you gonna say to her? See how that's no fun for people who wanna complain? They're like, well, anyway, I just thought, okay, I'll just call Kelly and tell her. <laughs> you see how, if you hand it back to people, with a solution, like what are you gonna do? It almost nips it right there. They, they don't wanna play anymore, it's not fun. Unless you're like, she is so mean, and then it goes and gets out of control. So you can control a lot of where the dialogue goes. In fact, um, that's one of the rules, right? You're controllables. Can you, what can you control and what can't you control? I did something in community education for whatever school district is right next to Dinah, I can't even think what it is, but um, they said we have a new voting referendum or something. We need a person to get most of the parents to come out. Can you do a, like a sexy title that we get more people to come to? So I called it Drama Free Communication with Your Teenager. They had a record number of people who came out, right? So we just looked at how to deal with, and I don't have teenagers yet, so I know I'm probably going to eat it, but um, <laughs> here's what I learned that night. Here's what I learned that night. Um, most people were trying to control things they couldn't control, and once they really got that, it made a huge difference in their stress level. So I, I'll give you two examples. One guy was a single father who lived right across from the high school, and he said, listen, my two girls are really good kids. I get up really early and I go to work, and I come home every day, and the lights are on, and the music is on, and every, the fan is on, everything is on. And I say, you need to shut off the electricity. You can't leave the need, should, can, ought to. And the girls were like, Dad, I know, we'll stop. Okay, you know how the kids are, right? And he couldn't get them to comply. So I was like, well, you can't tell them what to do. You can't control them. But have you ever thought of telling them why they need to? So, you know, I used to be a college registrar and English teachers, they don't turn their grades in on time, okay? Now I'm a professor and we hate the registrar. When I was a registrar, we hate the English professors, okay? Because the English professors are like, I can't turn my grades in, I have 500 essays, so I can't read them all in one night. Well good, then assign them earlier, how hard is it? I mean, this is like a huge conflict with cross teachers and administration. I remember as a college registrar, it occurred to me, they don't know why, they don't know why I need them. So I went to their meeting, I was like, hey, did you know why I push you to get your grades in and I'm so aggressive with it? Let me tell you why. As the registrar, 
I have to input everyone's grades, and then I hit a button that rolls the grades onto all the students' transcripts across the entire university. I can't hit that button till your grades are in. And in the meantime, we have VA people waiting for their benefits and work compensation, and we have people, and then the teachers are like, oh, that's kind of a big deal across the, yeah, it's a big deal. So when you tell people the why, sometimes they can get on board quicker. So I said to the dad, did you ever tell him why? And he's like, what? And I'm like, when you were that age, did you understand that electricity costs money and toilet paper is something you have to buy? Or, I mean, did you understand that? And he's like, not really. I said, maybe you say this. Hey, girls, your spring formal's coming up, and I really wanted to buy you those new dresses. But I don't think I'm going to be able to because our light bill's pretty high. <laughs> but you know what? Do you think we could shut? I mean, do you see how the kids would comply just because they get the why piece to motivate them? That was one example. Another example I had was a father who was also like a coach of his kids' football team. And he's like, listen, I work with some really great kids, but recently some of them have been smoking, and I don't want smoking. And I don't know how to control this. Like, what do you do? And I was like, well, what is your rule? I told my kids, they can't smoke. And I said, well, you can't control that. You're damn right, I can't control that. I'm like, wait, that's not what I meant. And I said, what I meant is, if you are at work, and someone comes up to your son and is like, would you like to have a smoke? You can't control that because you're at work. So you're going to get crazy in your head thinking you can control that and then shooting on your kid all day, right? So what could you control? As the football coach, do people want to hang out at your house? Yeah, we have like the house where everyone hangs out. That's what you can control. You can say, hey guys, I noticed that some of you are experimenting with cigarettes. I don't allow cigarettes in my house. I don't want anyone underage smoking, let alone have it around me. If any of you come in my house with a box of cigarettes or you smell like cigarette smoke, I'm going to ask you to leave. Then you can control that, right? Or you can tell his kids, if I find out so-and-so is smoking, I'm not going to let you stay at their house. Or you can control that. So that's another question, is what can you control? And then you all know the willing, evil, evil, willing. I want you to take a couple minutes, though, and um, in your head, or if you're a writer, think about someone who really irritates the heck out of you. And I want you to go crazy in your head using those naughty words, like you should shut up, and you need to get a job, and you should pay your child support, and you should quit drinking. And you know those thoughts you have about the person that drives you nuts? This is actually a good methodology. In other words, the next time you get angry with someone, I would suggest that you vent about it in writing. Don't put their name on the paper because they might find it one day. And um, you should use all the negative words when you vent. And then all that negative words will show you what you don't want, right? So then you can get your mind clear, go for a walk, come back, and say, now that I know what I don't want, what do I want? And that question will help you find the issue. And remember I said the issue is the reason you have a difficult moment with someone? And if you can get it right, you have less stress. So if you wrote, you need to shut up during our meetings. You need to be more professional overall. And then you go for a walk and you come back. And you're like, okay, what do I want? I want him to refrain from being on his cell phone all day at work. There's your issue. Can I talk to you for a minute? And then you nominalize your language, you get rid of the pronouns, not you're on your cell phone all, no. The constant uh, use of your phone at work has become an issue. I wanted to talk to you about it. See how easy that could be? So venting has its place as long as you turn it into what you want. But I also will tell you that you turn your complaint into a request, right? What you don't want to what you want. But I also want to remind you that what you think about other people is what you actually do to them. That is Projection 101. That's why at the beginning of the meeting, the opening comments were how much your self-talk affects the way you treat other people. Mm -hmm. Here's my dad. I get out of the prison down in um, Fairbolt, and I have to drive all the way to Duluth on like a Wednesday night just so I can be there for my kids in the morning. Do you think I want to drive that far after a 9 p.m. let out? So I get on my cell phone. Here's my dad, all aggressive on the voicemail. Hi, Judy, this is your dad. I'm like, wow, that was factual. Um, I would appreciate a call back, preferably tonight. Well, yeah. I am so freaking stressed out. Here's my brain. Preferably tonight. Don't hurt yourself there, Dad. Uh, I would like the call back tonight. Preferably tonight. I'm like, oh my God, Dad. Okay, so I'm just like already judging his like aggression and his certainty in his language. 
Guess what my next thought is? My dad is seriously so controlling. Who does that? Like, oh, preferably, preferably, sorry dad, I'm working, I'm not retired. I mean, you know why you just get aggressive in your brain? Look what happens. <coughs> when I think the thought, my dad is controlling, my thoughts and behavior towards my dad become controlling. Guess what my next thought was? I'm not calling back. Who does that? I would never control someone. He can wait. But I would never control someone. I don't do that. I'm a good person. He can wait till Saturday. You see how because I told him he's controlling, I start controlling him? If I didn't have that thought, I would be like, oh, hey, Dad, I love you too. How's it going? I just got off of work. We do this across the board. Mom, you need a dog. You're alone now. She's like, piss off, honey. I don't want the responsibility. Sorry, I've done my stuff. No, Mom, you need to get a dog. You need a companion. And then you buy your mom a dog, and you wonder why she hates you. You know why she hates you? Because what were you thinking when you bought the dog? You were thinking, when I get older, if I'm ever in a situation where I'm alone, I would get a dog. So then you give your mom a dog. Most people will even tell you no, thank you, no, and you still do to them because you, you're thinking about yourself. That's projection. I use this as a way to even kill conflict. I, I taught an interpersonal communication class, and I talked about sex and sexuality right out of the book, right? But I probably said it in a way that wrote people wrong. I had a guy come up to me, 23 years old, in the Lutheran Brotherhood, and he was pissed. And he said, I want to talk to you. I was offended by some of your comments today, and I, it's not OK with me. You know, I'm 23 years old, and I don't care if you have an alphabet soup after your name. People believe what you say because you're the professor, and you were, you were wrong. And I'm going to call you out on it. And I was like, wow, OK, well, you seem really upset. Let's talk about it. And he's like, you know what? Today you made a comment like men in a healthy relationship who are sexually active are more happy than men who are not. <laughs> and I was like, okay, well, the research does say that men will report that when they are sexually active in a relationship, they are more happy than when they are not. That's actually a fact. And maybe I just said it in a way. No, no, I, I am a man, and I made a commitment that I would not be sexually active until I was married and in a healthy relationship. And I, you can't say that. That is wrong. So I just, like, agree to disagree. He would not let it go. So then I'm like, okay, this is bigger than me, right? This is not about me. Watch how easily projection takes on its own course. Okay, what is he doing right now? He's trapping me in my classroom, and he's pushing his personal views of sex on me while he's accusing me of doing it to him. That's what we all do. I had a babysitter once. On my, I had a four-night classes, and um, I needed a nanny like at night, but you know you don't want to transport your kid from a bed to a car when they're sleeping? So I kind of wanted someone to live with me, and then they would be on at night. She was awesome. She was a lifeguard during the day, so she was never at my house. I got to pay her less because she was gone. Or I mean, because I, um, sorry, because I did the laundry and fed her. One day, she did not get there on time. In my mind, I thought I said, Carissa, every day I want you here at 5.30. I don't teach till six, but I like to leave early. I thought I said that. No, I never said that. So in my mind, I thought I was leaving at 5.30. In reality, I was leaving at like quarter to six because you know how you kiss your kids and ding around. The one day that I had to be to work on time, she wasn't there. It's like 5.30, 5.29. I'm out there with a the diaper bag at the time, and I'm like, car, open door. Where is she? It's pretty aggressive, right? But I'm important tonight, and I got to get to work. She comes up the driveway, a little too slow for my liking. <laughs> I usually transition with her, like, okay, they eat, and we're gonna do baths. No, not today, I'm like, I need to go. And I hand her the kid, and I get in the car, I think I gave her a stink eye in the <laughs> And then I am pretty good about writing and driving and doing all these multitasking, so here's me while I'm driving, writing. Krista is, is irresponsible. Krista is rude. Krista needs to be more kind. Krista needs to, is this funny to anyone yet? <laughs> Every single thing I wrote in that piece of paper, I did to Krista. Carissa needs to be responsible. Okay, how responsible was I in the driveway transitioning with her? Carissa is rude. Okay, how rude was I to every single thing I accused her of doing? I did to her. You see how this really is a tool? You could even believe me when I say whatever you accuse people of, you probably did to them, right? It's like you accuse your significant other, you never tell me anything. So when they finally are excited to talk, they come to you like, what's going on? Nothing, it's not like you care, loser. 
you never listen to me anyway. And then you don't talk to them, accusing them of never talking to you and telling you anything. I mean, we're doing it all the time. So what I could have done with Carissa is I could have cooled off, assume that I know that I did wrong because I wrote it, and go, hey, Carissa, can I touch you for a minute? Did you uh, notice that I was a little rude um, when we transitioned? Um, maybe you could see I wasn't being very responsive. You just suck it up and admit you did it. I promise you, you did it. Just think about that. It's a good way to stay mindful of your own behavior, right? There's not enough bad people in the world to make you a good person. So we're all guilty of it. Okay, how do I want to end this presentation? For the few folks who may have heard me before, it's my favorite story, and I am a storyteller. It's my favorite one. It's going to make sense, though, with stress. I lived in Burnsville for 10 years on a cul-de-sac, and this was before having children. Don't live on a cul-de-sac, right? Because it's like, oh, you've got a pizza? you got a new washer and dryer? <laughs> You don't want to be living in a circle because people know what's going on. And then I had a neighbor named Phyllis, which God forbid no one knows her because look where we are. But um, her name was Phyllis, and she's very sexy, 65-year-old widower, um, hip and trendy realtor. We called her something like freaking Phyllis. And um, Phyllis was incredibly in your business and shooting on you every five minutes. She told me so many times I should plant in my flower boxes that one day I ripped them right off the side of the house. I mean, this woman can get to you, okay? So she knows how to shoot on you. My husband's name is Molson, like the beer. It's not hard. She called him Muhammad for 10 years, okay? My name is Jody. I write it with a Sharpie on her Christmas cards. She called me Joni for 10 years. So Joni and Muhammad <laughs> were living next door to her. And she would, I just gotta paint how bad this woman can make me crazy because this is gonna be bad quick. She would get us to do stuff for her all the time. Muhammad, could you uh, let me borrow your chainsaw? Can she use the chainsaw? Guess what he did all day? Cut her vows. You know there's those people who can just get you to do stuff for them? So she would be like, you need to plant your flower. Joni, could you come over here? One day she is knocks on the door aggressively, 8 a.m., no kids, weekend. I'm not up, I'm in bed. I go running down the stairs. What is my house on fire? What's going on? She's like, Joni, I've been breaking my leaves all morning, and now I'm afraid all of your leaves are gonna like go in my yard. <laughs> Promise me that you guys will rake today, right? Right? You see how you're like, awesome to see you, Phyllis. Do you see how you just want to pop off at this thing? <laughs> and uh, the worst thing that she ever did to me, like she used to be like, Joni, and my deck was way up high. And I'd be like, oh, okay. She'd go, burr, 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 burr. okay, okay, Phyllis, I'm, Phyllis, I'm going in now. And, I said, and I'd shut the slider. She'd still be talking. I mean, she's just that personality. Um, here's the worst thing she ever made me do. Could you come over here and help me with something? Just dress rubby. Now this one is always just two nights, I'm like, this can not be good. It's like 3 o'clock on a Sunday, here's the pitch she gives me. This was back in the day. She goes, um, you know how I'm into sales and money and stuff? And Well, there's a new business. It's called spray tanning. And in order to sell it, i got to get tanned. So could you spray tan my naked body for me? <laughs> and I did. <laughs> And I'm not kidding you. There's a reason the universe made her my neighbor. And at that moment, I had the biggest epiphany of my life. Number one, as a conflict trainer, I've been lying to people for a decade at that point. I had been saying, you just don't plug in. I can fake it on the outside, but on the inside, I go home and like, you know, work it out on some cake or something. But the truth is, Phyllis was living what I was pretending I was living. She taught me a lot that day. Now, in case you don't see where I'm going with this, Students say, it is what it is. God, I hate that sentence, because nobody's living that reality. You know who says it cooler? Byron Katie is one of my favorite authors. Byron Katie, she's in her 80s now, she's amazing, she's guru level. She says, when you argue with reality, you lose, but only 100% of the time. <laughs> Guess what language you have to use to argue with reality? You need to stop drinking, you can't talk to me that way. You should pay your child support. You're not going to be late again. Do you under? Byron Katie would walk in and go, do you know why I know she was supposed to be late again? Because she was. It's called reality. Why are you arguing with it? And it would end right there. Now, I'm not saying we condone other people's behavior, but you see how it stops just short of fighting against something? 
That's where the stop is, right there. Phyllis showed me where you stop. If you start arguing with reality, you start showing people what you stand against, and you start shooting on them, and it grows and it grows and it grows and the drama grows. So what did we learn today? I have no idea. <laughs> okay, what did we learn? Do not shoot on people. We have three new favorite words. What are the words? Uh, Feeling, need, prefer. And when you get to a true impasse with someone, that's the answer. What do you do? It's a choice, and then what do you do? Jody, I, do, I can't get a B in your class. I need an A, I'm gonna go to graduate school. Listen, if you choose to turn, you can choose to turn that in still. You have until tonight at five. No, Jody, your class is like a whole level class. I have big assignments that are due for my upper classes. I have been here every day. Can't you just give me the points? No, I don't give away free grades. But if you would like your grade to turn into an A, you can choose to do this worksheet, get it to me by five, you'll get the points. Jody, you don't understand, like, if it's gonna keep being an impasse, where it's like denying, defending, counter-attacking, you give, listen, here's what it is. If you choose to do it, you choose to get the A. If you choose not to do it, you're not gonna get the A. Yeah, but Jody, what do you do? That is the answer. If you say it without the sarcasm. It's like, what do you do? It's like your choice, what do you do? It's a choice, and then they complain. If you play into the complaints, you're right back in it with them. So that really is a good end statement for a true impasse. Give them a choice, they have to act one way or another, and then if they rebuttal you and try to start it up, you're like, what do you do? It's on you, it's a choice. Thank you, and hopefully you'll help us stress this school year. All right.